I could Sorry to interrupt. Hi, <laughs> Hi. I'm Julia. I'm, I'm managing the, the webinar today, this afternoon. So welcome everybody. We've got John here and Laura and also Gavin. Um, thanks for joining us. So we will have a um, presentation, a discussion about the future of US wilderness from you guys. So that's very exciting for the next uh, one and a half hours. Um, I hope all of our participants, our audience is back already. And well, I will give the floor to you guys. And yeah, let's start. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Julia. And it's an honor to be here. Um, thank you so much to the whole European Wilderness Society staff um, and their leaders, Max and Velado. It, it really is an honor to, to join this conversation. I really enjoyed our conversation Sunday night with uh, Shen Gao and, and Jeff Law and Max Rothsberg. And it was really a rich conversation that, that stretched me. And today in our panel, we're gonna, we're gonna pick up on a, a distinction that came out of that Sunday night discussion, the distinction uh, between wilderness and wildness. And we're gonna look at a progression from wilderness to wildness to kinship in the work that Gavin Van Horn and myself and Laura Watt have been involved in since the 2017 book, Wildness. A distinction that came up after the Sunday panel in a conversation over email between uh, Max and one of the participants at the end of that friendly debate, um, Max said, whether to intervene or not is therefore not the issue, but rather if the wilderness then becomes a wild area with human intervention. And so, we're going to play with that spectrum from what Max is calling wilderness all the way across different kinds of landscapes and processes um, to um, wild areas with human intervention, including, as Gavin may talk about, in, in urban areas. And so we're really excited to learn with you. Uh, in, in terms of introducing ourselves, um, again, I'm John Hausdorfer. I'm the Dean of the School of Environment and Sustainability here at Western Colorado University and a proud um, fellow at the, the Center for Humans and Nature. I asked each of us to kind of share a memory of when we were first drawn to wilderness. And for me, I was probably about 10 years old. I was in Quebec, about two hours north of Montreal, around Mont Tremblant, and hiking in the Laurentian Mountains, which are the oldest mountains in the world. And I remember as a kid looking at those mountains, just blown away, like the oldest of the whole planet. And I was walking through the woods and I stepped and fell into a bear den. There was not a bear in there at the time, but from the scat, I knew what it was. <laughs> and I just had this like sense of awe. I was scared, obviously, but it was also so beautiful. And I was just moved by this sense of the world's not made for me. You know, I'm in it, but it's not made for me. And, and that's the first time I was humbled by what I would call wilderness. Uh, go ahead, Laura. Okay. Um, hi, I'm uh, Laura Alice Watt. Ordinarily, I'm a professor of um, geography, environment, and planning at Sonoma State University, which is just about an hour north of San Francisco in Northern California. Um, right now, I'm on sabbatical, and I'm a Fulbright slash NSF Arctic Research Scholar. Um, trying to remember my title, uh, located in Northwestern Iceland. I'm, um, my host institution is the University Center of the West Fjords in the West Fjords of Iceland. So um, I am out of my usual habitat right now and really enjoying it. <laughs> and um, for, my, for my memory, the, or you know, sort of that first thinking about wilderness is kind of the exact opposite of John's. Um, no bear den was involved, but um, I spent all my childhood summers just a few miles north of where John is sitting right now in Colorado in the Rockies. Um, my father's a biologist and does research at a high altitude field station every summer. And that's where I spent all my, my childhood summers. And so we would be hiking in, you know, what on a map is identified as wilderness um, with trees and huge mountains and animals and everything that you expect in a wilderness. And then we would come across the remnants of old mining cabins from the 1880s silver boom that happened in that area and busted very soon after. And to me, that 
gave such a richness to these places. It wasn't just trees and animals and rocks. It was also these stories, these hints of stories that I found really intriguing and that those, those remnants of human history in such a wild place, um, I think have really shaped a lot of what my academic career has done. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Gavin? Yeah, hello. Uh, glad to be here. And um, so my name is Gavin Van Horn, and I work for an organization called the Center for Humans and Nature. And there I'm the creative director and executive editor. Um, our mission at the center is to explore and promote ideas about right relation between humans and the whole community of life. So um, we think about these issues. We, uh, we gather people together from different fields and expertise to um, share their own stories uh, of interaction and regard and practical ethics um, on the ground with uh, the natural world. And so I encourage you to visit that website, humansandnature.org. Um, as far as a, a sort of big W wild moment uh, for me, uh, I, I think it was probably um, a summer I spent in Glacier National Park uh, in Montana. Um, which is uh, an incredibly uh, overpowering landscape with, you know, glaciers as the name implies, uh, you know, mountain arites, uh, you know, uh, wonderful divide between the western slope, which is kind of temperate rainforest and the eastern slope, which is a drier, more sear kind of ponderosa pine landscape. And they don't call Montana big sky country without reason. Um, it is a sense of vastness uh, and spending that summer there. Um, I also had a couple of bear encounters um, that also contributed to that, to that, you know, grizzly bear on the trail um, where we uh, wisely, I think, decided that we would turn around and go the other direction rather than keep going. Um, but I also wanna say that, you know, that sense of wildness or uh, that sense of the otherness and the affinity that I had with nature was there from childhood and, um, and kind of uh, similar to what John was saying, that understanding that there was something uh, much bigger than me that I was a part of. And uh, I think it began early, uh, that sense of connection, that sense of relationship, uh, with the natural world and, and other than human species. And I also just wanna say, um, cause I noticed the logo of the European Wilderness Society, which is the screensaver for uh, people who aren't on video that um, eventually this led me uh, to get my PhD in religion and religion and nature in particular. And uh, I did my dissertation on the reintroduction of wolves to the American Southwest. And so um, it's kind of heartening to see that uh, <laughs> that symbol uh, there, the howling, uh, you know, we're only the mountain alone uh, knows what's going on. Yeah, well said. And I like, you know, all three of us are kind of getting at uh, the humility when faced with something larger than ourselves. You know, with Laura, I think that deep sense of, of history and culture brings about that vastness that you're, you're not the only inhabitant of a place and therefore you don't fully own it right you're a member of it just as others have been uh human and more than human and gavin as we shift into the more than human and, and what you what you have said in your work um about coyote gavin has a beautiful gavin has a beautiful book called the way of coyote um where he even finds that humility from other species in the city um it really gets at an idea that i credit europe with you know, that, that made its way across the Atlantic to influence the early wilderness idea. And that is the idea of the sublime, right? When awe and fear and the sense of beauty all combined together to humble, to humble us in, in the face of a, a world much bigger than us. Um, and so, you know, in 2017, we started to look at how does wildness um, humble us? and teach us across a whole spectrum of landscapes. And um, I wanted to share my here to feature um, European Wilderness Society's continuum. Gavin, you'll find this interesting. Laura, you'll 
is we talk about this based on, on some of Rod Nash's work from you know half a century ago. It, and and you can can everyone can you see this? And you can enlarge your own screen if you need to. Um, but you can see that uh, the European Wilderness Society, I believe, has over 300 indicators for measuring wilderness quality. So you go to the bottom, you see bronze, silver, gold, platinum, based on meeting those indicators, and they're working with parks and other kinds of open land areas to try to get Europe to 2% um, wilderness. They have wild forest, wild island, wild coast. Uh, I think I'm leaving one out, Max. And across- Do you want me to jump in? The wild forest. What's that? The wild forest. Yeah. And you all can see that uh, it's not just designated wilderness areas with the capital W here. Um, there is a continuum of, of where these, where so, as, as the society calls it, where self-willed land expresses itself. And I show this because, you know, when Gavin first approached me with the idea of the wildness book, Gavin wanted to celebrate a continuum in the American idea of wildness that we find um, the capacity of communities and beings to renew themselves everywhere from designated wilderness um, across working landscapes and into urban areas. And we wanted to celebrate um, the whole spectrum of self-renewing systems, uh, self-renewing, self-willed social environmental relationships. And, and that's what we've done in the book. And so in thinking about this continuum, we wanted to hear from you all and begin with the wilderness end of that continuum and uh, have you in your chat box there, if you wouldn't mind just sharing, you know, a brief definition of wilderness and I'll, I'll get you started. You know, in the 1964 Wilderness Act, right, talking about wilderness as the places where man is a visitor who does not remain, right? Um, I, I just shared mine, um, a uh, community system being that renews itself without dominating capacity or others in that system to renew themselves. Another interesting one that came up, oh, I sent that to panelists, not everybody, my apologies. Um, so, the one that just showed up, there um, to all panelists is, is, is from Jeff Law in our emails with Max. Wilderness is a physical setting defined by qualities such as naturalness and remote, remoteness. Um, you can see mine above that community system or being that renews itself without dominating the capacity for others in that system to renew themselves. Tobias um, says a place where humans are not the dominant influence on the landscape and enter with utmost humility and respect for the more than human world. Thank you, Tobias. That's really well put. And I like the fine point on not the dominant influence. So if you all would just take a minute to share yours and, and I'd like for Laura and Gavin to kind of either share theirs or react to um, what people are typing. And, and I think I'm gonna have to lean on the European Wilderness Society staff here because I'm not seeing a lot of participants. Oh, 36 participants, good. Your fearless leader here, and you are welcome to challenge him, everyone. I've seen Max very open to being challenged over time. Hi, Max. <laughs> An area where undefined, open-ended natural processes without human intervention or extraction happen. I share you a very challenging case study. image. Go, go ahead, Max. I just, I I was triggered by your colleague who was just up there. And let me quickly share a screen because this will now shock everybody who is now in this setting. That was for 86 years, an area used by the military. 
It literally looked like this in 1992. And because there's so much ammunition in the ground, nobody could use it. It was impossible that it would be used for anything. Okay? Russian tanks, nuclear bombs, everything was in there. It was polluted. And that was the area six years later. From this to this. And it was attributed to one simple fact. We could not go in and start a restoration process. We, by the default that there was so much ammunition in the ground, and this is Gary Oy, by the way, who could not believe that natural processes could take and come back so quickly. And it was so fast that we were even unable to remove the bunkers because they wanted to restore it. We want to turn it into a wilderness. We had millions, but we had to stop because the danger to humans was too high. The wolf returned within three years. You still see the old walls of the villages that were moved in 1914 out of the area when the Prussian army set up the military. And this is now totally self-governed land. The roads, the trees are removing the asphalt, not us, it's nature. This was area where the wine crossing by the Russian army was tested. This is what it looked like eight years earlier. And now it is the most diverse, cleanest part of Germany. The water has got a water quality that's unbelievable. This is what it looked like in 1992. And this is the same area today. Big question is, is that wilderness, yes or no? Okay, Laura, Gavin, what, what are, you've seen some definitions coming into the text. You've heard from, from Max and seen these images. What, what are just some thoughts you have in reaction? Laura, you wanna go or you want me to? I'm, I'm always, uh, I, I'm not sure how to respond because I, I, I still have so much trouble I, with the, it certainly is a wild place to me, very wild and that's fabulous. Um, I still have a lot of trouble with the term wilderness because it so often brings a lot of idealization with it, um, which I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of in some of the definitions in the chat. I, you know, obviously Europe has been, acknowledged to have been populated by humans for far longer than um, some people acknowledge human influence in the Americas. Um, but I find that that sort of idealization of nature with no humans is a very, is often a very racist presumption, not that the people themselves are racist people, but that that presumption wipes out the existence of a lot of people and who had very deep influences on what we consider now wild landscapes. So I struggle with even the term wilderness. Um, I, 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 I totally agree that I think um, natural processes often hide a lot of human influence in ways that, that are important to pay attention to, that places we often think of as, as wild and untouched are actually have these very deep human paths. And so the, the, when the definition comes along that says humans aren't there, yet you see as the photographs you were just showing show that incredible capacity of the natural world to sort of exert itself um, I, that makes me uncomfortable with wilderness definitions that exclude humans. Gavin? Yeah, I would, uh, I would just say that it's a wild place, not because uh, I think, you know, picking up a little bit on where Laura uh, was, uh, what Laura was stating, it's not a wild place because of the absence of, of humans. And I think we need to um, work on being careful about that, setting up that dichotomy seeing the will of the, the self will, if you will, of the land express itself because the pressures that have been put upon it historically 
have been removed is exciting and, and heartening. Um, but I think it's important to think about and to focus on how humans can align themselves with those landscape processes. And it's not, it's only in recent history that we've thought ourselves unable to align ourselves with those kinds of landscape processes. Um, and we've kind of adopted a very cynical view of human beings because of our big uh, footprint, our impact, um, because of the industrial age, um, you know, and the power that, that can be wielded by nation state governments, there's a lot to be, um, a lot to feel um, very, you know, uh, cautious about and disparaging about and to be critical about the ways in which humans have applied, you know, a, a heavy hand and have assumed a, a, a control or a dominionistic, you know, um, ideology over the natural world. But that's only a fraction of what we're capable of as, as human beings. And so um, I think landscapes like that are, are a beautiful sort of example and, and baseline that you know you can point to look what a, a what you know look what happens when we aren't so when we aren't heavy-handed but we can't let that set up um, this dichotomy uh, that human presence is necessarily degrading it's not plenty of cultures throughout history have have proven otherwise so you know just to bear that in mind so I think what John mentioned earlier, thinking in terms of spectrums and continuums rather than either ors is really important. Yeah. With I've that, been, Gavin, I think I can get a lot. Who's speaking? So, sorry, John, I'm jumping because I'm just quickly going to, to Tolora's and Gavin's point on this. Okay, the, I want to get to the chat comments, but go, yeah, go ahead, Max. The basis of this was basically a long process that started with the wilderness act and then ended up in europe 2003 2004 when suddenly this idea was picked up and then it took like 230 experts for three years who sat together with the icn and they did go one step further they did say using that continuum that there is a need for a certain part of the world where we literally take ourselves out of the equation to the most maximum possibility that we can. I mean, through rain, there's always some form of impact. And the reason for it is very simply said, we are a result of evolution. And the evolutionary processes have until the 1850s, basically in some part of the world continued but where we as ecosystem engineers have suddenly learned, and Gavin, you put it nicely, heavy handed to change the environment, not just to our benefit, but also to the detriment of everything around it. We, in Europe at least, we've come to the conclusion that we basically have put a stop to that evolutionary process. Not completely, because there's some, some pockets left where this is happening, in the oceans, and let's not only focus, because we're also focusing on, on aqua marine wilderness, but everywhere else, we are interfering so heavily that otherwise we wouldn't be heading into the sixth, sixth extinction. And the amazing thing is that even in those wilderness areas, now with climate change, it suddenly is on the table again to intervene even there. And I'm challenging Jeff Law because we all know the Tasmanian forest. It's a beautiful forest. And suddenly forest fires are threatening these areas. Should we intervene to protect the forest? And I'm saying, yeah, we can. Like, we are, we are not criticizing that we are interfering. But it suddenly then is not anymore a self-willed land. Yes, we humans can go into the Königsberg Heide. We can go into the 42 areas we have in Europe. We can look at it. We can observe it. We, we can learn the intrinsic value. But keep your hands in your pockets, basically. Do not take them out of your pocket. Because the moment you take them out, you, you're, you're intervening in those processes. And we often do not do that 
because we want to hurt the nature, because we think we know it better. And that is the most amazing thing in this discussion. Rewilding, restoration, saving a species. I mean, Tobias presentation yesterday. Yes, we want to save the cutthroat uh, trout. It, it's all valid. We must do that. But must we do that everywhere? And that's the question with the continuum that we are raising, saying, do it there, but then do not call it wilderness. Call so, it a wild area. And, and I want to get to the, the comments in the chat here. I just want to say a couple of quick things. One is, you know, for those of you who are not um, focused on U.S. wilderness um, history, what Laura was talking about with there being um, some problematic racist connotations around wilderness idealization is what I was talking about on Sunday night, where to create Yellowstone, the Bannock were removed, to create Yosemite, the Shoshone were removed, the notion of calling someone's homeland that their ancestors shaped a wilderness that hasn't been used is, is, is very dangerous and justified Indian removal and a lot of other uh, racist and genocidal policies. I don't know if that critique of wilderness fits a European context. We do know that when we transported that US idea, it led to uh, Maasai being removed to create Serengeti and things like that. Um, and, and Max, your, your com I wanna get to the chat here, but your, your comment is, is well taken, you know, that on this, this massive planet, um, you know, can't there be a percentage of land that we learn from as, this, as you showed in the slides or what happens if we just keep our hands in our pockets? Um, I think just to problematize that a little bit, um, it, how can we, how can we, we can't keep our hands in our pockets because our hands are in the problem. You know, the, the fact that the soil is dry is from us. The fact that the fires have been suppressed for 100 years, so there's too much timber on the forest floor being dried by climate change. The fact that there's longer droughts, um, the fact that there's a cigarette butt in the first place, all of that is us, us, us. So I, I just don't know in the age of climate change what it even means to keep our hands in our pockets since we've already touched everything. Um, Tobias here, uh, ha, uh, actually, no, I want to go to some, Gavin and Laura, I want to get some of your thoughts on what just, some Can I pick up just one little piece this, of what you just said, John, because I think yeah, it's go ahead. important. And I think it, it serves as a bridge between what you and Max were saying, um, you know, in terms of hands in, in pockets or not in pocket, they're already out of our pockets. We don't even have pockets anymore, whatever. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I think that you're both speaking to the attribute, which has already been mentioned, which is humility. How do we approach these landscapes with humility? And sometimes that means, um, you know, being wise about the systems and how they're operating and, and, and intervening with humility rather than intervening with um, a sense of, uh, or intervening with an, interroga an interrogative point of view, an inquiry-based point of view, rather than intervening with um, a kind of God's eye point of view of, we know exactly what should happen here and we're gonna do such and such, if you know what I'm driving at there. Well, and I think it gets back to the word you used, alignment and and um, Vlado uh, and Kura, who this, this conference is named after and who I've learned, learned a lot from wandering European wilderness together. Um, he's, uh, he says an important element of European wilderness are spontaneous uh, natural processes. And he says, this is part of the slides. And, and I wonder, Gavin, you used this word alignment. And so, you know, is there an alignment um, between the natural processes of the land? Um, like Valida says here, where acts of human intervention has enabled nature to proliferate. Is there a, and Laura is, and you may have seen this um, in Point Reyes, which we'll get to when we show your video, but is there something to be said uh, about an alignment between human intervention that accelerates nature's processes? Max? Well, I think going back one step when you mentioned Yellowstone, I mean, I'm questioning whether some of those wilderness should even carry the name wilderness. Because if you had to remove the wasabi, you have to remove the natives, 
Native Americans. It was really a land steal, full stop. And the big question is, do we actually need to call them wilderness? Maybe we should real name them. I think this is, this is what I was trying to make. It's not a question whether we should interfere or not interfere. The question is where, and Gavin put it nicely, are we able in some parts of the world to just observe? And yes, it's going to be a big challenge for us because of climate change, forests will turn into desert. But the big question Vlad and I have, is a desert not a wilderness? Just because the trees are gone? It still is. So it's just the way that nature adapts to what we do outside of that area. Laura, so, is, that, is that still a dominant choice of a dominant species to say, let's observe if that forest becomes desert? What do you think of, 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 of Max's point? Of becoming I, I, I think whether you're um, whether humans are manipulating that environment or are intentionally putting their hands in their pockets although I do want to point out most women's clothes don't have pockets um, so, <laughs> yeah. sorry about uh, that sorry about that <laughs> I wish they did but still some of us don't have pockets to put our hands in um, but you know whether whether we're acting or not acting, it's still a decision that we ourselves are making. And I, to me, there's also, I, there, are, there, I can't think of a single creature or plant in the world that doesn't influence the environment that it's in. So I feel like there, I know obviously there's, there's a, a vast continuum between, um, you know, the, the little blades of grass out there that are doing their thing and, having some influence on what's around them and humans building skyscrapers and so forth. That's a pretty wide range. But this idea that somehow nature operates on its own in some way that's totally different than what humans do, to me is, I, my dad's an evolutionary biologist, we're all part of this. And so humans are creating new evolutionary pressures on things that it's still evolution that's happening. It's not like evolution itself has stopped. So I don't know if that's making any sense, but I don't- It is, and it is, Laura. And I think Vlado asks a good question here for, for Gavin, Laura, Max, anyone, you know, about humility and, and about that, like your father's, as an evolutionary biologist who's worked in the Rockies, uh, you know, for over 50 years, he has such intricate knowledge and, and Vlado asks this question of, you know, can we, why do we think that we have the knowledge to accelerate natural processes? So that, you know, Gavin, your point about alignment, can our knowledge go that deep that we can trust ourselves to align? Laura, your point about us being part of evolutionary biological processes. My point about we can forces that accelerate natural processes. Vlado sort of asking that humility question of, why do we think we can know nature well enough or, or the human place in nature well enough to accelerate that? And is there a point at which Max and Blotto are right that humility dictates just stopping in certain places? You just can't know our place in it. And I, I'm just gonna add one other twist to this. I, 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 have, I have nothing against humans stopping in certain places, although who gets to decide that? And what does that actually look like? Does that mean, you know, one of the, the, the fascinating things about um, places like the, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the place you were showing the photographs of, but where there's been some kind of either military um, contamination or, you know, um, uh, nuclear contamination or whatever, where people simply cannot go in at all. There's a, that's a different kind of wild space perhaps than, um, a wilderness area where people are recreating. Um, Cause that's one of the things that I often get grumpy about is the way that we, we segment off um, recreation as somehow being harmless and having no effect. Um, and so it's okay if everybody, you know, even with, you know leave no trace ideas and so on. Humans are still in that place and are still having an influence on that place if they're recreating. But we tend to see it recreation as if it's invisible and not really part of that world. Whereas work in a landscape or residence in a landscape 
somehow taints it and makes it human manipulated. So there's, I wanted to add that element. It's not just are humans there or not, but what are they doing while they're there? And how do we privilege certain kinds of actions versus others? No, I, I need to add one sec. One sec, Max. If you don't mind, I, I just want to, yeah. Kevin has this religious studies background and we're talking about humility and I'm just interested in what, what his take is on, on Vlado's question. Yeah, so uh, something stood out to me in Vlado's question and, uh, and maybe he was just picking up on something you said, I can't remember where it came in the conversation, but he kind of asked, you know, how can we know that we're participating in the acceleration of wildness. And I thought, well, there's an uh, interesting metaphor, acceleration, like that there's this, somehow we can, you know, uh, you know, participate in this growth, you know, economy, if you will, of, of, of wild, of wildness. And I think that we should, uh, we should, <laughs> to use another industrial metaphor, we should pump the brakes on that. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and really stop and think about you know, when I say alignment, I'm talking about, um, I think there's an important word that goes along with that, and that's listening. How do we listen effectively to the land? Um, and I know that, that that can be a tough thing when we're talking about IUCN land designations and having, you know, quantifiable, you know, uh, measures of what are essentially quantitative, um, you know, feelings about these landscapes. Um, and but I think that, that that positionality of how, how do we become better listeners? And it's not impossible for us to communicate um, and be communicated with, with other species in the landscape, to think that we're somehow, there's a, a barrier or like a two-way mirror between us and other um, species and things, I think is uh, an unhelpful uh, thing to uh, hold in our... And Mind. Before we shift back to our fearless founder, Max, um, Valida has this interesting phrase, um, why can't we focus on the intention of respectful interdependence? So maybe accelerates the wrong metaphor, maybe Vlado is right, we can never know nature on that level, but can we ha have a certain intention of enhancing wild process, or as Anne Jeanette says here, um, the rethinking the role we assign to humans, our intention our role, can that be humble and enhance, can that be a humble intention to assign ourselves a role of enhancing wildness while still being humble about the fact we can never fully know the parts and processes of the more than human world and our place in it? You know, <laughs> when does that become more humble, our intention, right? When does it become less humble? Um, Maybe humble is not the goal. Max? I think we can pull this all together. Gavin, you said this being more humble. I can tell you when Gay Oy, who was running the US National Park Wilderness Service with 600 wilderness areas, did not believe us that a military area for 86 years could be called a wilderness. And when we took him into that area for two days, he came out and said, it is the most amazing wilderness he has ever seen. And he then, and I'm sending him to Chernobyl now, another area that we as humans have totally desolated, mm -hmm. but nature has bound back so fast. He, he said he has seen processes that he has never seen in areas where we humans, sorry, Laura, are not keeping our hands in the pockets because over, over literally five, 600 yards, all seven evolutionary stages of a forest can be viewed there from, uh, you know, with the beavers involved from an old growth forest to literally a, a, a dead empty lake, which is just becoming life again. So these, and, and remember, we're talking about the continuum. So Laura, for example, the idea about tourism, for us in the wilderness as we define it, gold or platinum, is virtually not existent. We recommend you're allowed to go in there only with the ranger, no groups of more than six people, and no trails, I'm sorry. To experience, Gavin, what you said, that humility to see how nature reacts 
if we do not take the shovel along. So yes, if you do have those hiking paths and footpaths, it's still a wild area. And we in Europe have got these two wilderness definitions, wild area and wilderness. So all you're moving, you're moving a little bit down the continuum. So it's still a great place to see. It is still has some natural processes in there, but not anymore to the same degree that we see in those other areas. <laughs> and therefore, and now comes the next challenging thing for you guys to think about is uh, we basically define the wilderness, not looking at the past, but at the moment we stop interfering or extracting. And at that moment, we basically say at that moment an area is a wilderness because at that moment it can do whatever it wants. It will go whichever way it wants to go. If it wants to become a desert, it becomes a desert. If it wants to become a rainforest, it becomes a rainforest. And we suddenly learn and all of those managers we have taken into those areas have come back with a new, with a new view on their protected area or their nature conservation work that they have done so far and have shown a different kind of humility because they suddenly see those intrinsic values on what nature can and cannot do. But the difficult part is the first five hours we are in there with these managers. The only thing you hear is, guys, there's still a rodeo. Why didn't you remove that? Uh, when are you starting the restoration process to remove the bunker? When is this trail being more natural? Why is this river still straight? So you hear all of those demands to restore what we in our mind think nature should be. And then you leave them for a while and then they walk out and says, actually, maybe next time, I should think twice about what we do in my area at home. Yeah, yes, and, we still need to do something, but we should think twice about it. And we have, we have an interesting challenge from Skylar here. Uh, he says, it seems to be a very Euro Western and cerebral conversation. He says, cultures through millennia grappled with this. I'm assuming he means the human place in the more than human world, uh, as Laura has been getting at um, early on. Most effective ones that work with sacred plants to transcend the limitations of human logic. You can talk to the cows, come home. Uh, you're not going to figure any of this out. You need an actual education, wildness, and natural immersion. So, you know, a couple of things there. One is, I would anybody who, who shares Skylar's view, I would say yes. Let's let's get out there and try things. Um, let's make sure we're humbled not only by the land but by cultures that have struggled with this. So, thank you for that. Um, I, I would also suggest uh, to those who, scare, who share Schuyler's view, look at the European Wilderness Society's work. The idea is to determine whether or not we leave real land, as you saw on the slides, alone, or we intervene in some way. This has real implications for real land and real species and real peoples. And we should also be reflective and really cautious to not be so Western and European that we're misappropriating Native American practices, um, like ayahuasca vacations. But what, what do others think about this challenge? You know, is, is this too cerebral? Are we, you know, just sort of talking and talking through this, not breaking through that boundary of, 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 of sort of Western logic to get at what our place in the universe really is through getting out there in nature, through trying other methods to transcend these kinds of logical debates that happen in conferences. There's, there's, there's some artifact of the people who are invited to speak at this. I mean, I, I, you get a bunch of people with PhDs, you get a sort of a cerebral conversation. Um, and it's funny, yeah, I'm sorry I'm, for being an egghead. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I'm currently living in Northwest Iceland where um, there really aren't a whole lot of uh, sacred plants that could do exciting things for me out there because there's not very many plants out there. <laughs> but there um, are uh, elves, right? Yes. Yeah. You there don't you mess go. with them. <laughs> um, they've already messed, they've already told me that my, they, uh, they want my camera to do things that I didn't want it to do. Oh. Um, so that's exciting. Um, 
so I mean, I, I I think that yeah, there there's there's of course a lot of different ways of understanding what wildness is can be, but again, it's to me there's there's maybe I'm I'm too obsessed with our the the title of our book from a few years ago, y'all's book really. I only had one little piece in it um, of making this distinction between wildness and wilderness because to me wilderness is such a um, a legislated concept and a um, a uh, idealized concept that that it it's funny. I was um, I was actually thinking so one of the comment. I'm, it's very hard for me to read the chat and talk at the same time, so I'm I'm not keeping up necessarily. But someone mentioned something about sort of wilderness is often very black and white. It's like it is wilderness or it isn't. And there aren't a lot of gradations. And something that I actually wrote in the very first article I ever published in as an academic back in 2002 was saying, you know, hey, when you do um, a rehabilitation of a house and historic preservation practices or something, you have this great continuum between something that's been preserved down to the last nail, exactly as it was built or what have you, and you've got then, you know, rehabbed or restored or completely reconstructed, um, which is a lot, which, which is what a lot of current day wildernesses essentially are, right? Is they're reconstructed ecosystems, whether they've reconstructed on their own or because humans have gotten in there with the shovels and said, we're doing a big restoration project. It's, it's, it's useful it, to make that distinction between something that was modified and has recovered um, into something new that is different than what it was before, rather than just sort of saying there's wilderness and there isn't and never the twain shall meet. Yeah, and you know, the other part about the scholar's point that I think is really important is how, how do we bring in uh, other ways of knowing from non-Western cultures uh, to complicate and complement our, our sense of the human place in the more than human world? Um, how do we immerse ourselves, right, both experientially and how do we um, interact with the way in which other cultures immerse themselves without co-opting those cultures? Uh, there are two comments here, Kristen Hanke and, and um, Katia Gonzalez are referencing uh, Dr. Enrique Salmon. He's going to be speaking in my class tomorrow night. He, he's Rara Murray, uh, indigenous from Mexico, and his chapter opens with the line, there's no word for wild in my language because he thinks the his people were and are a keystone species and their way of producing their society resulted in more biodiversity. And so what is wild if biodiversity comes from your society? And Gavin, I think this is a good transition to asking you about the wildness book. Given these debates about wilderness, we're, we're thinking through, right? Um, Tobias is talking about a set of policies that protect land where man is a, bit, a visitor who does not remain. We have 45 million hectares of wilderness owned land in the US. So these cerebral ideas result in real policies affecting real conditions on real land. European Wilderness Society trying to get 1%, 2% wilderness for Europe and their definition is hands in pockets, right? So these ideas land on the land, if you will, and really shape the land, but their, their ideas around how do we treat wilderness zoned land, um, Gavin, could you talk a little bit about why you wanted to do a book called Wildness instead of Wilderness and, and why we brought, why you wanted to bring so many diverse voices into that and, and, and what that idea of wildness might add to this conversation? Yeah, I think this is a really appropriate point to bring, or uh, a point in the conversation to bring that uh, out and highlight that. You know, we, uh, we've already had a nice slide on this spectrum and we can talk about what you know, exactly should be on that spectrum or how we should, should tweak it. But with wildness, we, I know, John, you and I coming out of this, you know, sort of very American context, you know, and questioning our own um, conceptions. Um, the idea of wildness, uh, the idea, I think it can be put simply like this. If wilderness is a place in terms of what John was saying, we zone. There are certain areas that are zoned as wilderness, and you have different um, kinds of uh, of actions there as a result. Um, then wildness is a process. Wildness 
is what flows through Big W Wilderness, and it also flows through what was of concern to me and why I wanted to do this book, which is urban areas. Urban areas have typically been the environmental villains in stories about, um, or larger narratives about what is truly worthy of environmental attention or conservation attention. That's changing. I think it's changed dramatically in the last two decades, let's say, and even more so um, as, as we go along here. But I wanted to draw attention to that for those that find themselves in cities, whether because they were forced to migrate there um, uh, or whether because there was security there that there wasn't in rural lands or whether just for job reasons, they, they needed to go there to make a living. Um, that these areas weren't depauperate. They weren't biologically devoid of life. In fact, once you open your eyes to the kinds of life that can exist and adapt to urban areas, they can be incredible places um, and worthy of, of our attention and concern and our care. So those urban areas where that wild process is not, it may be say tamped down, it may be inhibited, there may be barriers put up to it, but you know, it, it is not gone by a long shot. And sort of like those areas that Max showed where the military equipment had been removed and then these areas exploded. I mean, there's already wildness from the peregrine falcons that are nesting on skyscrapers to the coyotes that are weaving them way, their way between every single American city in the United States right now. Um, you know, those are the larger sort of examples, but there's all these micro wilded areas. There's all these restored areas and cities. So I really wanted to draw attention to what happens when we turn our attention and our care to what is right in our backyards. And we don't, we don't have to um, say, gosh, I, if I'm really going to have a true experience of the natural world, I'm going to have to get in my car and drive 200 miles, you know, to a wild area. No, it, you can step outside your, on your balcony in an urban area like Chicago, which is the, the region I live in, and um, connect to those wild processes. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you think of this spectrum of wild process, we wanted to bring different, not only different connections to wild process into the book, we also want to bring different cultural ways of knowing get back to scholars question you know so on the capital w wilderness zoning side of things you know we have rod fraser nash we have gary snyder we have robert michael pyle but as we move into working landscapes uh we have people like you know courtney white who work on um bunching and moving livestock around to mimic wildlife to enhance grasslands and carbon sequestration on working lands and, and to enhance habitat on working lands um, moving down that spectrum to, uh, you know, um, Gavin's interview um, with a, an African-American um, urban wilderness advocate, Henry Jordan, and um, places like Eden Place, if you look that up, Eden Place, uh, you see an incredible effort to restore wildness to, to the um, African-American community in Chicago. Um, and so a lot of these questions coming up after Black Lives Matter and George Floyd around what we call intersectional environmentalism. How do we merge, you know, sort of social justice and wilderness movements uh, it, it is something that we really wrestle with rather than separating those movements. Um, I do want to share a brief video with everybody that gets at Laura's contribution to the book because Laura gets at attention between wildness and wilderness in a beautiful place called Point Reyes, California. And so what I'm gonna do here, you can see this YouTube link. I have found that videos don't play well on Zoom. And so um, what we could do is- um, if Quiet, you could... quiet, quiet, because it did work lately if you- No, I got it, Max. One sec, uh, I, what, has it been working for you? It has been working if you see optimized video for online screening. Well, okay. I tend to just have In people- that little blue, little, three little dot thing there. You can say optimize for video screening. Just try it when you share it. Give it a try. We had many other problems with Zoom, but that was not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, hang on a sec. Could you see and hear that, Max? Yeah, but you have to go on share screen and say optimize. On the top, it says view options optimize for online video. Yeah, my friend, it's not letting me do that. So I'm just going to, in the interest of time and flow, if everybody would well, please we do it off -site. do it off. And um, copy the link and press mute yeah. and go ahead and watch it and come back to the conversation uh, when you've watched it. And we'll hear Laura talk a bit about her case study on this tension between wilderness and wildness. Okay, it looks like a lot of you are finishing up. Um, sorry, we were talking at the beginning. Um, I like how Vlado built off Gavin's distinction between wild process and wilderness places um, and says wild wildness process should not be against wilderness. Laura, you know, I wanna celebrate you here because this wasn't just a film that we made featuring your chapter in wildness, you turned this into a whole book. Um, so I. The floor is yours. How, how does this case study speak to the conversation we're having and, and affect real people in real places, not just cerebral ideas? Go ahead, Laura. Um, well, like I, I added to the chat, um, one of the, the things that I was re reacting to the most at Point Reyes in my work there um, and the, the sort of discussion of wilderness there is in some ways a smaller part of a larger project that like you said, turned into a book um, called The Paradox of Preservation, if anyone's interested in looking for that. Um, and what, what continues to make me angry about it, honestly, is the way in which the wilderness label gets used in, a, in, an, in a, essentially a dishonest way because what was, what was the management decisions that were being argued about really had almost nothing to do with the wild character of the landscape, the wild, the ways in which this place is or isn't used by humans. Um, it really was about um, some folks wanting control over the landscape and, is, and saying, we, we think this is a national park and that people, specifically residents, don't belong there. And so this is a, uh, the particular crowbar we're gonna pick up to try and wedge them out of here. Um, and it was remarkably successful. Um, it did not matter what kind of um, actual data or information got brought into this conversation. The, the legislators who wrote the, the, the bill that created the wilderness at Point Reyes specifically put uh, you know an uh, and had an op-ed in the paper saying that's not what we meant when we wrote this we have nothing against the oyster farm being there and yet the rhetoric of that ideal is that idealized wilderness was so powerful in the public eye that it succeeded in closing this operation down um, which is just um, and and that in turn has become sort of the first salvo in a series of political, disputes trying to now remove um, historic ranches from the same area that have been there for 150 years. Um, so it's, it's, it's that way in which a, um, an argument about who should or shouldn't be allowed to use this park in what ways gets disguised as a conversation about wilderness when it's not really about that at all. And so that is part of what I was reacting to, which like I said, I think in the chat is maybe a little bit different than the conversation that's been going on here. Yeah, and I appreciate your your humble recognition of how this is an American context and things could be different in Europe, but, but Peter Dratch here says he was working for the park service at the time of the oyster farm controversy. And he, he's to him even it felt like institutional arrogance and to, to add some more context for folks in terms of the Wilderness Act, one of the arguments that was being made was that if there, an exception is made 
for Drake's Bay Oyster Company with this coastal wilderness designation, then that could have legal implications and set precedent for challenging all wilderness areas across the US. That was the argument that wilderness activists were making, kind of a slippery slope argument, a fear that if you create one example of sort of human wildness and a wilderness designation working together to enhance biodiversity, then it's like fair game to go mining and logging, et cetera. Is that right, Laura? How, how did you see that? That was, that was, in my opinion, a, 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 a not valid argument. There was all kinds of um, legal language that said, this is not precedent setting. And in fact, when you go back to one of the interesting things about um, digging into the history of establishing this particular wilderness designation was that at the time, the main rationale for, for trying to bring this estuary into wilderness designation was to keep motorized recreation out. It had absolutely nothing to do with the use for cultivation of oysters. And yet, because the definition of wilderness in, in terms of the political debate in the US has shifted so much from the 1970s when it was designated to the 2000s when this argument was playing out that people had forgotten that, that was what it was for. Um, there was, but there was no way that, that somehow allowing a historic and fairly benign use of a, of a natural landscape to continue could in any way have created a slippery slope precedent for opening up existing wildernesses to new uses. That's just crap. Sure. So I, mean, I guess uh, in shifting here, thank you, Laura. And I put the title of your book in the chat as well as Gavin's uh, book. Um, you know, Gavin and Laura, I have one question for you from Tobias. And then I have a question for Max and Vlado and everybody. Um, Gavin and, and Laura, one of the things uh, Tobias pointed out was he, he shares your, your excitement for urban wildness and I think your empathy for the Drake's Bay Oyster Company, Laura, um, but he's concerned that in progressive circles now there, there's less passion for sort of wilderness itself and for its own sake as we learn to learn how to see wildness on working landscapes and in urban areas, he's found uh, you know sort of less vigor for, for wild land itself in progressive circles and I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. And then I wanna to shift to the larger conversation to see how Laura's case study is instructive. Um, but go ahead, Gavin. Yeah, I'd love to jump in here actually. Um, and I'm just reminded of how powerful Laura's uh, case study was uh, for our book and really untangling some of those fault lines um, you know, between these different perspectives and in a really critical uh, where, where there was really something at stake, there was community at stake. Um, and that leads me into what I think unites Laura's essay with Tobias's comment. And that's that, that um, you know, one's passion for, a, you know, wilderness does not have to fade. And in fact, it may only be enhanced by, uh, by bringing people into touch with the idea of wildness and that it's um, in their backyards and that it's um, on the rural landscape and that it's in these big wild areas. Our intimacy and our connection to the natural world is formed closest to where we are. And that informs how we think of and how we um, fight for, if you will, um, these larger areas. And I think the real paradigm here that's common to both these things is that the goal, I think, should be to move from a, a, um, an extractive relationship with nature to one of reciprocity. And if we could have alongside these idea the, the um, wilderness zoning, what if we had in place in, in Laura's case study, where there was a, a qualitative analysis or quantitative analysis even because the water quality was improved by the oyster farm. What if we had another form of analysis where we could say, how, how well is this business operating within the cycles and the systems that are there on that landscape? In other words, a 
a sort of um, reciprocity measure that would then inform so that we didn't have to say it's either out or it's in, how well are they living with that landscape and becoming with that landscape and in community with that landscape? You know, uh, another contributor to our book, Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, talks about what she calls the honorable harvest. And that idea to, you know, there, it's more elaborate than this, but the basic idea is that when you approach plants, you ask permission um, to use those plants to, you know, that if you take that perspective, you can't clear cut a forest. You, it's, just, it's just off the table, you know? So how do we live into that reciprocity? And so the reason I bring up extraction is because it applies in both cases. Like how do we move from this extractive ideology where everything just becomes uh, objectified and into human coffers, essentially um, living things are transformed into capital. Um, to one of a reciprocity where we are living uh, well in that landscape system and benefiting from that living well. As other, there's mutual benefit, I think is the wor word that, or mutual dependence is the word that Laura used. Mutual dependence that leads to mutual benefit. Okay, Laura, guys. that was well. Oh, yeah, I, I you can see questions about time. reciprocity coming in. Uh, Vlado, there's one for you. Are there indicators for measuring uh, reciprocity? I need we to go back. I need to go back. I think we are stuck because it seems that we are so hung up on the term wilderness that just to achieve that, we are willing to sacrifice everything in this world. And I do not know why that happened. It seems that the word wilderness has been elevated as this supreme thing that is above everything else and everything must be subdued to it. And I think that is the absolutely wrong way to go. And the question to know is, what stopped the world from taking that beautiful area and just take the name wilderness out of it? The area would still be beautiful. It could be called a special designated area. It could be called whatever you want. The problem arose because of a human-human conflict. Because some people were fighting for a wilderness that just didn't match what was there. And everything was subdued a word. And, 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 and we have the same in Germany right now. They want to have 2% wilderness. To achieve that, they were willing to kick people off the land. And now they put up a 50 million euro fund to buy land just because some politician wants the 2%. And that will never work. So I think we are talking here about and, and willing to sacrifice even the, the definition of wilderness just to meet some human goal. And I think the whole oyster farm would have been easily solved by E, a zonation system, have the wilderness stop before the farm is there. The area behind it, just from the picture, was very natural. Natural processes were happening. There was minimal human impact. I didn't see any trails going through it. Yes, it would not have been maybe 10,000 acres or 50,000 acres. It would have been smaller. But from the sake of what we talked about earlier, these natural processes would have still happened. And Gavin, you just made the point. Your oyster farm actually would have supported the wilderness because of clean water and everything happening around it. So the wilderness could have benefited from this human establishment. But somehow we get stuck in, if we do not call it wilderness, it's a big disaster. It's a gigantic disaster. Why? It's still nature. Well it's still beautiful. It still serves its role in ensuring human survival. It, it enhances ecosystem services, biodiversity. Everything. Uh, back to Laura and, and Max, I think your point really flows back to Laura nicely. And, and Carol has asked, you know, does putting a label on wilderness create an inherent dichotomy that results in a loss of nuance? I think that, that's what Max is getting at. And then Valida, is trying to make the rubber meet the road and saying, can there be indicators for the kind of reciprocity that Gavin's talking about? Uh, and some of you may be watching this thinking, oh, they're splitting hairs over words. No, because that word wilderness 
in the Drake Spay example, got people stuck in the notion that that company couldn't be there. Words matter. Laura, what are your thoughts on this? Um, exactly that. That you know, this 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 was absolutely a a, a wild place before it got called wilderness. And in fact, once the label wilderness was applied, I think it's actually a, in a lot of ways a less wild place. Um, it's, it's it, as particularly because once the oyster farm was closed, the, 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 the part that's wilderness is not the place where the buildings were in the pictures. It's the water where the actual uh, wooden racks that the oysters hang off of um, uh, is and for the when when we were filming this the huge crane that you see you know I'm walking past I think and that um, uh, we were talking about is there to remove those oyster racks so it actually was just this for several years this strangely sort of um, industrial looking site with these gigantic cranes yanking stuff out with absolutely no environmental impact an analysis at all of what pulling that stuff out will do to that ecosystem. Um, so it's, and I, I do hear the argument often that, oh, this was a mistake, um, but point raise is really not very indicative of the larger scenario for wilderness. I actually think it's far more indicative than many people realize. Um, it, just because it's right at that edge of, um, kinds of human use in the landscape as part of a protected area, which is rare in the US, but is very common in, in Europe, or at least more common. Um, so I think the, the, the idea that somehow Point Reyes is really weird and unusual and yeah, it was a mistake, but let's move on. It's the, the, the power of that label, the power of that political argument that wilderness creates is still wildly active there. There's um, now arguments about introduced tule elk and whether they, how to manage them versus um, ranches that they're living on, where again, the popular notion of what wilderness is um, that has very little nuance is, is politically really very powerful and is succeeding in removing people from their homes or shutting down their businesses in which are businesses or homes that are not necessarily harmful. To go back to Gavin's point really quickly about sort of, it, can we have a reciprocity measure? One of the problems there is what's the baseline? Like, how, what are you measuring against? Um, there's often at Point Reyes this, this argument that, well, ranches are causing degradation in some way, but the ranches have been there for 150 years. So how, what are you comparing? the impact they're having on the landscape too. There's no empty landscape to compare it to, to say, oh, I see this is having this impact. And it's where do you put that baseline? Is the baseline 10 years ago? Is it 150 years ago? Is it 13,000 years ago with Pleistocene rewilding or what have you? Um, it's always, it's, we're always creating some sort of arbitrary measure of how reciprocitized are we? That's not a word. Well, and that's Laura, for me, what's been so humbling about working with my colleagues in Europe is, you know, we in the U.S. talk about a 150-year-old baseline in terms of, you know, settler colonials, but they're they're looking at baselines back to the Ice Age. And, and I do have this, and we're going to have to close, but my closing question is for, you know, Gavin, Laura, and I, and other Americans on the call to think through, like, you know, what do we have to learn from how... European wilderness is approaching it through a continuum, through 300 indicators, through different kinds of landscapes, and, and, and maybe what could we offer given our, you know, 150 years of wilderness in America as, as Europe moves toward 2%. But first, I know Peter Dratch wanted to make a comment, and I think we made it so he can speak. Is that right, Peter? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, please. So I think one of the things that emerges here is we, we, we build these institutions like the National Park Service, which only really dates from, it's a barely 100 years old, and the Wilderness Act, which is 50 years old. And the question is how we build institutions which have the same adaptive capacity as natural systems. So in fact, they really can't, they, they don't become rigid. 
That was that's what was that was what was obvious at the at the oyster farm for those of us who are scientists in the park service that the park service was rigid and they thought that there was some point here that there was some principle when we didn't see it <laughs> you know as scientists we didn't see it and the same thing is true of the wilderness act there's, there's that, that people make the point that if we if we compromise here the whole act will collapse but we need resilient institutions the kind of resilience that we see in healthy ecosystems. They need a little wildness, mm -hmm. right, Peter? <laughs> Adaptability. And, and the, the, way you get that, the way you get that, by the way, is by having them populated with, uh, with diverse scientists, social scientists, others, when there's a diversity of viewpoints that actually not just get heard in a patronizing way, but actually have, have, have a deciding role, then institutions can become more resilient. Well put. And that's actually the perfect transition to really our closing, which is, you know, with the wildness book, we wanted to shift from wilderness and the way in which it, it has been rigid and created dichotomies to wildness, which is processes we can find and fight for anywhere, including wilderness land. And as Gavin said, finding it where we live can inspire more people to fight for it on wilderness land. We've gone from wilderness to wildness. Now, uh, Gavin and I and Robin Kimmerer are working on a new five book series called Kinship. And it was Gavin's idea. So Gavin, how, how does Kinship sort of take this conversation to an even more, as, as, as Peter said, um, flexible and resilient place? Yeah, well, you know, we, we wanted, uh, Kinship was a part of, of our wildness efforts as well, because we're acknowledging that we are, um, we're not only, um, wildness is not only uh, about the continuum of places, it's about depth in place or kinship in place. So, you know, we can talk about kinship in terms of our genetic, you know, connection on the, on the great tree of life, or Mary Midgley would say the strawberry bush of life, because it's a lot more lateral than most of us think of it. Um, but uh, and we can talk about kinship at different scales, which is what we're going to do in this book from planet to place to partners to people to practice what's happening on the ground, you know. Um, but the idea here is that, uh, you know, circling back really in some ways to where we began this conversation about what does it mean to be human? How do we become kin? You know, we're, we're born with certain, you know, genetic connections, but how do we live into our humanity? How do we become kin alongside all these other creatures around us? How do we deepen our relationship to place through our, our kinship practice? So that's what we're going to be exploring uh, in that book, that idea of, of becoming with. And I think that one aspect of this that, that crosses all of what we've just talked about is there is... I think sometimes embedded in, in certain rhetoric, this idea that we need to um, save nature. Um, we need to be, be sort of saviors. This is sort of Joseph Campbell, you know, hero of a thousand faces, you know, mythology that goes on, you know, that's so embedded in, in many of the cultures that we come from. And rather than think of ourselves as saviors, you know, I would, how do we become how do we become better kin? How do we become better lovers rather than saviors, if you want to put it that way? That's beautiful. And, and you know, I'll just end by, by sharing one of the final lines of the wildness book that, that moves from wildness to kinship. Um, and we're so honored to have Robin Kimmerer as our, our co-editor. She's a Potawatomi uh, indigenous, but also well-respected scientist. Re I suggest you read Braiding Sweetgrass. If you really want to see how we're trying to create a kinship between indigenous and scientific understanding. Um, but, but at the end of the, wild, the wildness book, my daughter is a scene where my daughter asks me, we're in a wilderness area in Colorado. And she asked me like, you know, why do I get so excited when I'm in a wilderness area? And I said, wilderness areas tell the story of people deciding to slow themselves down before taking everything. To learn from the world with humility rather than just desire. And wildness was about taking that ethos and bringing it home everywhere we live. And kinship is about doing that in, in a deeper way, you know, connecting with the world as family through humility rather than, as Gavin said, through extractive desire. 
And um, we're really inspired by the work you all are doing in Europe to move toward that 2% and create these spaces of, in which we can express that humility. Um, and we're really honored that we were able to join you all today. Um, thank you, Max. John, we always love having panel discussions with you and your colleagues because they're always inspiring. And I think the idea of kinship, the idea, I mean, we just found out, John and I, that the Chinese culture actually even has philosophical issues with the concept of wilderness. We in Europe in 27 languages, most languages don't even have a word for wilderness. The French do not, the Ukrainian do not, the Italian do not, they don't even know the word. They have a description for it, but it's a total foreign concept for them. But when you- so break you're the perfect down, place to create a new word. <laughs> well, we created, we are using the English word, pro and cons, it causes sometimes issues. But when you talk to the people, the cultural values, norms, and beliefs, you quickly find a common denominator. And that is what I think is so amazing. In closing comment, now wilderness for us in Europe is not black and white. It, it's not about it's a good or it's a bad one. It's nuances. But we still should be too that there are some standards you should abide by. And just because you don't abide by them, it doesn't make you less work. It doesn't make you, the humility we should show towards other people, other cultures, we should also show to nature. Just because there's a bunker, it doesn't mean it's not a wilderness. You know, and, and just because there is no bunker, it doesn't make it a wilderness. So there, there's all these nuances. By the way, today at 7.30, our time, Ben Hamilton is showing this great film he made for the 50th anniversary, The Meaning of Wild which is kind of picking up on that. If you haven't seen it, it's free. Normally you have to pay money, but he's offering us a free Vimeo film today because he's interviewing four different people along the Canadian Pacific coast, what wilderness means to them. And you get four completely different meanings for all in the same area, from a ranger, from a native, from a, an Inuit, from a Native American, from, from, from a business person, but they all love wilderness and they all share the same values. But it's amazing that little film, it's only 30 minutes. So if you have got the time, if not, I'm gonna send you the link. Well, and, and for those of you who only joined this session know that uh, I believe the rest of the week is, is free now due to an, a website glitch. Is that right? <laughs> well, we're asking for donations of 20 euros. Give me a break. I mean, you know, we need the pizza, we need the coffee for doing this five days, 13 hours straight. And our amazing team of young, dedicated people have pulled this together all by themselves. I have to say this. I just had the idea, they pulled this off and it's amazing what they did. So 20 years for coffee and a pizza, donations please. <laughs> so the and volunteers and our young employees and, and staff can continue to. And by the way, John, we want to do it every year. Wonderful, and uh, thank you again, Max. And for another day, everything you just said about 24 different languages in Europe without a word for wild and the four different definitions along the Northwestern coast of America in that film, <laughs> even more reasons why every time you and I go on a hike, I push back on your hope for a universal definition of wilderness. We still wanna do the house uh, swapping. So let's just hope you know who loses the election. Otherwise, you will not see me in the United States for another four years. <laughs> well, well, thank you, guys. Let me interrupt here. Thank you, John, Gavin, Laura, Max, and everybody else who participated in the discussion. Um, it was great to listen to. And